All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Hope all of you guys are having a great week so far. we got a jam-packed day for the show today. We're doing two episodes. In this particular episode, we're going to be hitting Spurs Suns from last night, Victor Wembanyama versus Kevin Durant. Then we're going to do a deep dive on the Dallas Mavericks and a deep dive on the Memphis Grizzlies, two teams that are performing unexpectedly to start the season. The Grizzlies are 0-4, and the Mavericks are 3-0. We're going to do deep dives on both of them and what I've learned from film so far this season. And then later this evening, we're going to be doing a breakdown of the two ESPN games in the Wednesday night slate, finishing off with Lakers Clippers in the evening, which should be a fun one. The Clippers have had the Lakers number for a while. Lakers aren't playing very good basketball right now, so I have a feeling they might get their butts kicked, but we'll see how it goes. Um, You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. This is our brand new YouTube channel. We're trying to get it off the ground. I sincerely appreciate you guys' support over the first week and a half or so. We're already over 20,000 subscribers. I am incredibly thrilled with how the show um, launch has gone on this channel. If you guys haven't done so yet, it would mean a lot to me if you took a second to scroll down and hit that subscribe button. Don't forget about our podcast feed, wherever you get your podcasts under Hoops Tonight. Follow me on social media, particularly on Twitter is where I've been doing, um, when I'm doing my film sessions, I'm clipping stuff that I notice and I'm putting it on Twitter. I posted like 15 clips this morning. And so I'm going to be referencing them throughout the show. Um, I recommend following me there because that's going to be a good way to kind of get a visual representation of some of the concepts that I talk about on the show. And then last but not least, I need more mailbag questions. We're hitting three of them at the end of the show today, but I need more of them for the future. Put those in the YouTube comments. All right, let's talk some basketball. So uh, Victor Wembanyama versus Kevin Durant. You know, we forget that Kevin Durant's an alien too, right? Like, we've had three players try to ISO Victor Wembanyama so far to start the season. There was a, a Dylan Brooks step back jump shot that he missed badly. There was a Paul George step back jump shot that he missed badly. And then there was Kyrie Irving trying to recreate his 2016 step back jump shot, which was also way off uh, on the right wing. And then, you know, figures, we forget that Kevin Durant in and of himself is a unicorn in his combination of length and size and ability to move in his coordination as a scorer. And he ends up in a late clock situation in the late first quarter. And he tries to call a ball screen to get Victor Wembanyama switched off of him and Victor does a really nice job navigating the screen and then applies a little ball pressure to disrupt KD's rhythm but KD just goes well guess I gotta ISO Wemby here don't have enough time to do anything else hits him with a hard uh, dribble drive to the right and a step back jump shot along the baseline gets it off over Wemby's contest and knocks it down it was one of those like kind of iconic basketball moments you see him over the years it reminded me of uh, this clip that you can find if you look around of Wilt Chamberlain blocking back to back Kareem Abdul Jabbar skyhooks and it's one of those things where Kareem was kind of like that generation's you know victor in a lot of ways and then you know Wilt is the previous generations and like he's winning that individual battle right and that's the thing is like it's kind of weird seeing Kevin Durant at this phase in his career where he's kind of like the elderly scholar the guy that we're like oh yeah I forgot he's freaking incredible as we've kind of turned our focus towards the future and it just kind of felt like a cool moment to watch that game last night the Suns controlled the game throughout Kevin Durant's just on a ridiculous offensive run right now uh, 27 7 and 5 on 59 percent true shooting despite his co-stars being out and facing unbelievably aggressive defensive coverages again like the Suns right now with Devin Booker and uh, Bradley Beal out of the lineup are playing a lot of players that teams aren't going to guard at the three-point line Josh Okoge is not getting guarded out there Jordan Goodwin's not getting guarded out there Yusuf Nurkic made a couple threes in crunch time last night but they're all open they're not guarding him out there Drew Eubanks is a non uh, sh- a scoring threat and then Nasir Little who uh, knocked down a couple of threes in the game last night also uh, not being guarded when he's at the three-point line and so as a result teams are able to zone up on the strong side meaning like ignore a player off ball to then come on the other side of the block so that they don't get a defensive three seconds call and just basically make driving not an option for KD so that he has to take pull-up jump shots right and then they're basically just filling the gaps on the weak side to make those skip passes difficult they're doubling him on ball screens they're doubling him a lot on isos as well they're able to throw the kitchen sink at KD because there's just not a lot of offensive skill around him right now. Um, that said, they do, you know, this is what, the third game uh, in a row that uh, the the Suns have played without Booker and Beal. And so they're starting to get that, that little, you know, drive and kick thing down on the backside of that to generate high quality threes. They did not shoot very well 
in the Jazz game or in the Laker game, but they did shoot much better in this particular game. Generate a lot of high-quality threes that guys were knocking down. Kind of were stiff-arming the Spurs around like 10 points for most of the game. But then Greg Popovich breaks out, uh, breaks out a 3-2 zone in the middle of the uh, fourth quarter. They get three stops in a row on it. And then Devin Vassell has a nice little scoring run where he rejects a ball screen with Josh Okoge on him and gets downhill, hits an and one over Yusuf Nurkic, and then he hits a nasty step back three over Eric Gordon and suddenly it's a three-point game right and so then the Spurs go back to -to man-to-man and Keldon Johnson's guarding Kevin Durant on a couple of possessions and KD gets him twice in a row one-on-one to put the Spurs back up by five but then down the stretch the Spurs just straight up steal the game they're down by five they run a baseline out of bounds play where KD and Yuta Wananabe uh, accidentally miscommunicate a switch. Utah's a little slow to get out, and Victor just hits a really nice shot, a little movement jump shot, a little 17 footer kind of move into his right, rises up and knocks the shot down. Um, on the very next possession, the Suns once again rotate the ball around and hit Yuta Wananabe for a wide open three in the left corner. And again, it's make or miss league. Uh, uh, Utah shot 51% on corner threes last year, missed this one. Suddenly, it's a three point game and the Spurs have the ball and so they run this play like a ball screen action uh, with Victor Wembenyama on Devin Vassell and Reggie Miller on the TNT broadcast said a really nice job of calling out how Victor was bailing out of screens early and this is something he's going to have to work on because like there's a tendency when you're uh, setting ball screens to want to get out quickly because you want to be ready for the basketball right so you want to roll quickly you want to pop quickly and you want to be ready to catch the ball right but at the end of the day your opening is actually going to be a bigger result of how good of a screen you set because if you don't set a solid screen and the on-ball defender is able to stay with the primary initiator, then the de- that, then they don't need to overhelp on the backside and you just won't be open. But if you set a solid screen and you allow your ball handler to get separated from Josh Okoji or whoever it is that's at the point of attack, then the backside has to help. And when the backside has to help, that's when if you pick, to, pick and pop to the top of the key, you're going to be wide open. Or if you're rolling down the lane, you're either going to be open for the pocket pass or the skip pass is going to be open. It requires you to set a good screen. And this is something that like doesn't get discussed nearly enough in the league. Like for instance, a, a matchup like Jokic and Anthony Davis. Like we talk about all these differences between them, but one of the key differences between them is Nikola Jokic is an excellent screener and Anthony Davis is a bad screener for his position. And so that sort of thing is a huge area of opportunity uh, with big men in the NBA. And it's something that Victor has to get better at. But anyway, he bails out of the screen, right? And so when uh, Devin Vassell dribbles over to the right side of the floor, the on-ball defender's on him. So the play completely falls apart. But on the play, Devin Vassell settles for a tough pull-up three, and Kevin Durant gets caught ball-watching and doesn't box Victor Wembanyama out, who slips right behind him for the tip dunk to make it 114-113. to 113. And then on the inbounds play, again, like a lot of times, uh, traps on the inbounds, what they'll do is the guy who throws the inbound pass, the guy guarding him will then quick trap, right? And then a lot of times, like teams will rotate down and take away the inbounder as he comes in and make you throw an over the top pass. But the Spurs didn't even do that. They ignored Akogi when he slid back in bounds. And so he was right there waiting for the basketball, but KD just didn't see him. Didn't even, and then he also didn't see Keldon Johnson looping around behind him for that steal, takes the ball away. Then uh, uh, Keldon Johnson just goes right downhill and attacks the rim and makes the shot to end up essentially winning the game. KD misses a prayer at the buzzer. That was an extremely difficult shot. Now, this is kind of the uh, the reality of Phoenix's offensive limitations without uh, Devin Booker and Bradley Beal. This is the second time in the last three games that the Suns basically controlled a game throughout and then blew it late, um, particularly struggling on the offensive end of the floor. Because they've actually been a really good defensive team without Devin Booker and Bradley Beal. For the season, the Suns are sixth in defensive rating. They are 11th in half-court defense, according to Cleaning the Glass. They have the third-best transition defense. They are allowing, um, th- again, like they don't have a ton of interior size, so they're struggling a little bit in the paint. They're 19th in opponent's points in the paint allowed per 100 possessions. But they are 6th in opponent three-point uh, three-pointers made and 2nd in opponent three-point percentage. You're seeing a lot of the elements that Frank Vogel brings to a team taking place. Physical point of attack defense, right? Uh, chasing teams off the three-point line, especially on the ball. He's always into ball pressure and chasing over the top of screens to try to funnel to his rim protection. Now, his rim protection is not great, but he's doing a great job of, of making opposing stars feel uncomfortable. And then another thing, and again, remember, I covered Frank Vogel pretty closely when he was with the Lakers when I covered the Lakers full-time. 
And one of the another element of Frank Vogel's kind of defensive philosophy is leave the right guy open. Essentially, in any given moment, if there is a guy that he doesn't trust to be able to consistently knock down shots, he will basically ignore that guy and overhelp on the other side of the floor. And the idea there is make their stars feel uncomfortable, guard their good shooters, leave their bad shooters open. They're going to get wide open shots, but they'll get wide open shots for the wrong guys. And that's a great example of that. They're second in opponent three-point percentage. So what's that? what that's telling me is that when teams are getting three-point looks, it's for the right shooters, right? And that that's textbook Frank Vogel basketball. I definitely did... Uh, did not uh, do a good enough job in my season preview and just kind of accounting for what uh, Frank Vogel's defensive philosophy and and just his ability to get buy-in would do to this basketball team. Now, again, the question will be, are they going to uh, be able to maintain that level of physicality and, and attention to detail when Bradley Beal and Devin Booker get back in the lineup? My guess is yes, but we'll see. Um Uh, But every game has felt like Kevin Durant just being heroic on offense until eventually the other team wears them down with super aggressive coverages. Then they start to miss shots, and then they start turning the basketball over. The Suns are turning the ball over at a rate of 21.2 times per 100 possessions in the fourth quarter, uh, which is the second highest rate in the league for teams turning the ball over in the fourth quarter. And again, like it it really just will uh, uh, ease – like. Because Kevin Durant in general has not quite been as good at his, as his peers at managing like super aggressive coverages. Um, like I've always thought that Giannis and Jason Tatum in particular were a little bit better at it. LeBron's definitely a lot better at it. Luka's obviously a lot better at it. So like uh, compared to the other like big you know wing initiators in the league, KD hasn't been the best at that. But it's just not really that relevant because the Suns aren't winning a title if Devin Booker and Bradley Beal aren't playing anyway. And Bradley Beal, excuse me, Devin Booker said on the broadcast last night that he'll be back soon. Uh, now, who knows what that means, but him coming back is going to solve a lot of the problems. On the Spurs front, Victor Weminyama, once again, super confident in a clutch situation, four key points in, in, in crunch time. It's a huge story early here in the season. Uh, these are the leaders, the league leaders for clutch baskets made. Now, remember, that's within five minutes, less than five points. LeBron is number one with eight clutch field goals, but then Victor Wembanyama is tied for second with Luka Doncic at six clutch field goals made. He's six for nine from the field in clutch situations. He's got two blocks and a steal in clutch situations, three offensive rebounds in clutch situations, once again crashing the offensive glass for a key bucket late last night. And the Spurs are plus nine in 15 minutes of clutch basketball with Victor Wembanyama on the floor. And like, he just looks confident. He wants the ball. He's taking like difficult shots and making them like that based on out of bounds play. He's been actually hitting those movement jump shots at a high rate. I almost like trust him more on the move than in a standstill situation. He has a a remarkable ability to slow himself down and get really good lift as he rises up to knock those shots down. It's a lot of leg strength. I I think people have underestimated with how thin Victor Wembanyama is, how pliable, flexible, and strong he is, especially in his lower body with his ability to rise up and knock down shots. He had uh, four more blocks last night. I saw this crazy piece of lineup data when I was digging into it this morning. According to Cleaning the Glass, with Victor Wembanyama on the floor, the Spurs have a 103 defensive rating, which is awesome. That's an excellent defensive rating. When he's off the floor, the Spurs have a 130 defensive rating, a 27 point per 100 possession drop. So you're seeing the Victor Wembanyama effect on both ends of the floor here early on. And I don't even think he's been as aggressive offensively as he could be in the big picture. The, the, the it just you know, he had so many plays last night that I would consider to be like true wow plays at the NBA level. There was that dunk that he had at the end of the first half where he beat AD or KD on the closeout and then rose up with his left hand. He had another play late in the uh, – it was either late third, early fourth where he kind of like got – it pirouetted through the lane and had his back turned and then just like looked up and saw the rim and just threw it in off the glass behind his head uh, for an and one. He is absolute must see television. And I can tell you on this show, we're going to be covering him throughout the season because I just want to watch. And if I'm going to watch, we're sure as hell going to talk about it and I'm going to enjoy uh, covering this kid's career. Uh, Devin Vassell made two huge plays late. We talked about it, that rejected screen against Josh Okoji, and then that step back three over Eric Gordon on the left wing. He's 13 for 29 on pull-up jump shots so far this season. That's 45%. 
So that's really, really good. Uh, and he's also nine for nine at the rim, just being really selective about when he goes, not over penetrating, making reads when he doesn't see an option there. And then Keldon Johnson, he was the, the victim of Frank Vogel ignoring him last night. He was being left wide open at the three-point line. He attempted nine threes, seven of which were wide open, meaning the defender was at least six feet away. Uh, he's finding out quickly that that's the way teams are going to guard him until he demonstrates that he can make them. But last night he did. He made four of them, including three kind of important ones down the stretch of the game. NBA fans, the wait is over. Basketball is back. And DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA, is celebrating with an unbeatable offer. New customers can score $200 instantly in bonus bets for throwing down $5 on the NBA. Win or lose, it doesn't matter. You'll start the season with an instant dub. And with DraftKings parlays, everyone's got a shot at an even bigger basketball win. String together multiple bets from the same game or build your parlay across multiple games for a shot at making your payday even sweeter. Basketball's more fun when you're in on the action. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S. New customers can get $200 in bonus bets instantly for betting just $5. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code HOOPS. The crown is yours. For a limited time, Verizon customers can get Netflix and NFL Plus for just $25 a month. It's called Plus Play. That's $120 in annual savings. Plus Play is a platform where Verizon customers can shop, manage, and save on the subscriptions that you already love, right? Like Netflix and NFL Plus. With NFL Plus Premium, you get access to live games on mobile, my fave, NFL Red Zone, NFL Network and more. Just go to verizon.com slash plus play. Verizon.com slash plus play to save on Netflix and NFL Plus today for a limited time only now. Limited time only. Let's move on to our first uh, in-depth kind of like dive in on the Dallas Mavericks. So just a, a quick heads up for, for people. Um, I want, you know, I'm always wanting this show to be the best it could possibly be for you guys. Cause obviously there is no job for me here unless you guys come watch this show. And I've, I, I really, really want to work on giving better coverage of the rest of the league. And one of the things that happens is we do these instant reactions, right? And I end up covering the top six or seven teams really frequently. And like we'll hit of those teams, we'll hit like two thirds of their games. Right. And then the rest of the league, we end up not hitting nearly as much. And what ends up happening is then we do talk about them at the end of some show in some instant reaction. And we spend five, six minutes on it. And I just don't really feel like we get enough into the weeds to really uh, kind of dive into some of the interesting concepts that surround these teams. And so what I'm going to start doing more is fewer instant reactions. We're still going to do them. They're going to be a part of the show, but we're going to do a lot more of what I'm about to do right now, which is like just taking like, like, a three or four game sample of a team and then just doing a deep dive and just spending 10, 15 minutes on one team, not focusing on an individual game and what happened, but bigger picture trends, which players are playing well, which lineups are performing well, things they're doing well or poorly on both ends of the floor, areas of opportunity, things I'm noticing schematically. And so that's what I want to try today. And I'm interested in hearing, hearing your guys' feedback because I, I want, again, I want to cater the show towards what you guys want um, because you guys are the ones that make this all work, right? So let's start with the Dallas Mavericks. They are 3-0. Uh, they beat the Spurs and the Nets in their first two games. Crazy crunch time games, right, where Luka Doncic basically saved them down the stretch. Uh, but then uh, they notched a really quality road win on the road versus the Memphis Grizzlies without Kyrie Irving as they controlled the game throughout and went up double figures uh, in the fourth quarter and basically won without any sort of um, uh, stress involved, right? They're the number one offense in the league so far, 121.3 offensive rating. They're scoring 106 points per 100 half-court possessions, which is also the very best mark in the league. And it all starts with Luka Doncic. He's playing at a MVP level to start this season. 39 points, 12 rebounds, and 10 assists. 70% true shooting. His jump shot has been on fire. He's shooting 70% in effective field goal percentage on jumpers so far this season. A 
Luka Doncic jump shot is worth 1.4 points per possession right now, which is insane. You're seeing a lot of, again, like 75% effective field goal percentage on pull-up jump shots. He's 16 for 30 on his step back three to start the season. You're seeing a lot of Luka beating switches, like in the Memphis game the other night. Like they kept switching Jaron Jackson or uh, or Xavier Tillman onto him in pick and roll, thinking like, oh, Luka's a bully ball player. Uh, we can switch this action and basically force Luka to try to back down players that are just as strong as him, right? Well, Luka's counter for that is the step back three. And when he's hitting it in the low 30s, it's less than a point per possession. It's something that the opposing coach can live with. But when he's hitting it at 16 for 30 to start the season, it becomes untenable. And you have saw you saw it once again in that Grizzlies game, just step back three, step back three, step back three. We looked at the uh, Brooklyn Nets game, step back three, step back three, step back three. That's becoming essentially his go-to move against switches, and he's just making it at an extremely high level. He's shooting 75% in the restricted area as well. His shot creation has been absolutely ridiculous. He is picking everybody apart for the amount of help that they offer wherever it is on the floor. He In blitzes, he's able to just quickly step back and throw that two-hand over-the-top skip pass to the right guy. He had a really nice one against Memphis where he took that step back against the blitz and noticed the uh, the wide open player on the right wing and kind of looked at him to get Desmond Bain to kind of nudge up and then he hit the roll man with the overhead pass that ended up getting swung to the corner for a wide open three. He's just got complete mastery of half court offense at this point. The shot creation data is insane. He's averaging 1.14 points per pick and roll. In isos, and again, this is beating those switches that we talked about, 1.46 points per possession. Luka isos have led to 54 points, including passes so far this season. That's that's literally by far the most in the league. Here's how much. Second place is Tyrese Halliburton at 27 iso points created. So Luka Doncic has twice as many isolation points that he has directly created either by his own shot making or off the pass, twice as much than the second most in the league. This is like like unbelievable, unprecedented perimeter shot in the, uh, a perimeter initiation that we're seeing out of Luca. One point three eight points per post up. All this is insane, right? But again, you got to have the off ball production to make it all work. Derek uh, Lively has been an excellent pick and roll lob threat for him. He's four for five from the field on roll man possessions. One of the early season kind of like uh, big exciting things for Mavs fans. Again, like we talk about this when you're in a situation where your payroll is tied up and you don't have flexibility to go out in free agency and and pay for players or have the ability to bring guys back because of their current salary, you know what I mean, at a decent fair number where you end up not losing them, right? Um, One of the things you end up having to do in that situation is you have to hit on veteran minimum signings because when you're over the cap and you don't have the ability to bring certain players back with bird rights, it pretty much comes down to mid-level exception, uh, veteran minimum exception, biannual exception once every other year, right? Like, and then occasionally you can do something like they did with Grant Williams and make a sign-in trade, right? But you're ve- you're limited in your ability to make these types of moves, and so hitting on veteran minimum signings is like an absolute must, right? And they've just had a lot of guys that have played really well for them that they didn't have to move mountains to get. Derek Jones Jr. started all three games. He's doing a really nice job of punishing nail help. Now, nail help, again, is like, just imagine you have a corner three-point shooter, corner three-point shooter, three-point shooter on the wing, right? And then you're having your guy come up and set a ball screen. Now, Derek Jones Jr. is typically not a great shooter, right? But he's a very good athlete. And what a lot of teams have been doing is cutting and driving out of that weak side wing as opposed to shooting and so they're putting athletes over there rather than putting them in the corner or in the dunker spot like you would uh like you'd expect right and what's crazy is he's also making the above the break three as well now what is nail help if luke is calling for that ball screen right or if he's even on a switch attacking an iso or just dribbling the ball down the floor and attacking his individual matchup if he's on the right wing and Derek Jones is on the left wing, and Derek Jones' defender sags down to basically where the free throw line is, where the nail is, he's taking away the left-handed drive from Luka Doncic, right? But that's a closeout opportunity that's basically gift-wrapped for you, right? And now a lot of a lot of the reason why coaches will go that way is they'll think, oh, 
uh, an above the break three point shot is not going to be made at a high enough clip to really bother us, right? But Derek Jones has done a really nice job of driving that as well. He's made the shot. He's four for five on above the break three point shots so far this season. Had a bunch of them. I think he made three of them against Memphis, if I remember correctly, uh, which is funny because he's 0 for five from the corner. So he can't make a corner three to save his life, but he's making that wing three point shot a lot. But he's also slashing to the rim off of those possessions. He had two driving layups. Um, uh, at the rim in the last game, attacking out of that slot. He's converting spot-up possessions at 1.27 points per possession, which is excellent. And he's also taking some of their primary point of attack assignments. So like hitting on the Derrick Jones signing, just something little like that can change the trajectory of a basketball team. Josh Green has been excellent. He's shooting the ball and attacking closeouts really well. He's like a real downhill rim pressure guy attacking closeouts, and you actually see the defense on his rip-throughs really react to him, and he's good at making that secondary read attacking closeouts. Tim Hardaway Jr. has been J.R. Smith-esque with some of his freelance offense. He's 8 for 14 on pull-up jump shots and 3 for 4 on pull-up threes. It's not really part of the offense when it's happening. It's kind of just like, that's why I say it reminds me of J.R. Smith because like sometimes the ball just ends up in Tim Hardaway's hands and everyone just stands around and he goes one-on-one. And and really, it, it, it's, it's a great, when you have guys like that that are bucket getters, it is actually a useful tool in the offense in bench groups as long as he's knocking shots down. And early in the season, he's knocking them down. Grant Williams has been another signing, again, now through this one, through the sign-in trade, that has been a hit so far. 45% from three on seven attempts per game. I think he's been a useful defensive player and a very good rebounder for them as well, which we're going to talk about in a minute. The main area for opportunity in the uh, Mavs offense, and again, like the Mavs are the best offense in the league, the best half-court offense in the league. Biggest area of opportunities, Kyrie Irving's got to get going. He's passed the ball really well. I, I thought I thought Kyrie was excellent um, down the stretch in that uh, in that Spurs game in particular in the early fourth quarter, setting his teammates up for easy baskets. He's got good role chemistry with Dwight Powell, but he's just not making his jump shot right now. He's 5 for 21 on jump shots, and he's also missing at the rim. He's just 7 for 15 at the rim. So that'll push them to another level when he gets going at the same rate that Luke is going. But to be clear, like as bad as his individual scoring numbers have been when Luke is off the floor and Kyrie's on the floor the Mavs offense has been very good so I, I don't view it as an issue it's just something that can raise their ceiling in the big picture when he gets better again the biggest question coming into the season was could they defend and rebound at a high enough level to allow their offense to win games for them and they've rebounded extremely well they've grabbed 75 percent of available defensive rebounds that's the sixth best mark in the league after the Kyrie Irving trade last year, they were 20th in defensive rebound percentage. So they're rebounding much better than they did at the end of last season. Derek Lively has been great there, getting a lot of contested rebounds around the basket. Luka Doncic, and we're going to talk about this in general, he's way more engaged on the details compared to where he was last year. He's competing on the glass. He's closing out hard to the perimeter and funneling guys the way that he's supposed to. He's averaging 14 defensive rebounds per 100 possessions so far this season. That's 31% more than he averaged last year. So there's unquestionably, unquestionably been a higher level of commitment out of Luka. And then Grant Williams and Tim Hardaway have both really helped on the defensive glass. They're both really good with ball pursuit, and they're both they're both physically equipped to handle NBA players crashing from the perimeter, which can be a problem for some other teams that don't have that type of physicality. Those two guys are combining to grab 12.7 defensive rebounds per 100 possessions. Josh Green is really the only guy on the roster who's not contributing in a big way on the glass right now. Um, the Mavericks are allowing just 11.6 second chance points per 100 possessions, which is the sixth best mark in the league. On the defensive end of the floor, they're 18th in defensive rating. After the Kyrie Irving trade last year, they were 27th. So again, they went from being one of the very worst defense and rebounding teams at the end of last season to being a very good rebounding team and an average defensive team so far this season. And that's enough when your offense is as good as they are. They're 22nd in half-court defense. They're the eighth best team protecting the paint. Josh Green and Derek Jones have been uh, been doing a really good job of applying ball pressure and funneling guys to the rim. They're offering smart help at the rim, essentially prioritizing the paint in allowing three-point shots on the back end as a result. And again, like that's going to manifest in the three-point numbers, right? Like They're giving up uh, the 26th 
Um, uh, they're 26th in opponent three pointers made per 100 possessions. They are 25th in opponent three point percentage. So they're giving up a lot of threes and teams are making them, but that's like the one weak point. They're guarding the paint. Well, they're rebounding. Well, they're actually forcing a decent amount of turnovers. They're forcing 15.2 turnovers per 100 possessions. That's the 12th most in the NBA. So like, I like that approach. This is not a team that's going to be a top 10 defense. They're not physically capable of it. They don't have the players. They don't have the rim protection. They don't have the perimeter defense to be a top 10 defense. But what they can be is a team that makes your opposing stars uncomfortable, funnels you into their packed paint defense and forces you to make good decisions and make shots on the back end, which can be a problem when on the other end of the floor, Luca's killing you and it slows down the rhythm of the game. It gets you in your head. We t- we've talked about this with the Nuggets as well. Like I, I'm a big believer in like when you're making offense look easy, it gets in the head of the other team. And so like you put the onus on them to make the right decisions and to make those kick out passes. They're going to miss a lot of them. Grab the rebounds when they're there. Right. And then when you have opportunities to force turnovers like you have, take advantage of that as well. So like I like the approach. That's that to me is the 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 kind of area of opportunity for this team is be like right in that fifteen to twenty range on defense, be the best offense in the league and be a great rebounding team. If you do those things, you're uh you have a puncher's chance to do some real damage in the playoffs. And again, like that was kind of why I put the Mavs, everyone called me crazy when I said they had a one percent chance to win the title. Um and I consider them to be like the ninth or tenth best like actual champion Championship contender, and it's because you can't count out that high-level uh, offensive initiation if they can get enough rebounds and if they can get enough stops. We literally just saw that last year with the Denver Nuggets, even if it is a long shot. All right, moving on to the Memphis Grizzlies. Um, 0 and four, obviously not what you'd expect. This was a team that won consistently without John Morant in the lineup last year, and they brought in pieces to try to rectify that. Right with the Marcus Smart uh, trade, right. Um, a lot of focus is on the offensive end right now, and the offense is rough. 27th in offensive rating. A lot of specific issues. The shot creation with Marcus Smart and Dil- uh, Desmond Bain has actually been okay. Desmond Bain is having a really good season so far. Marcus Smart is actually having a really good offensive season as well. If you look at the the um, uh, the numbers, they have a 106 offensive rating with both Desmond Bain and Marcus Smart on the floor, which is bad, but like not that bad, right? Uh, like Especially if you're a great defense team and the offense has actually been pretty solid when one of them's on the floor and the other guy is off but they're playing a lot of minutes with both of them off the floor which is confusing to me because you'd think they'd stagger them a little bit more considering they're their two best perimeter initiators right now and the Grizzlies have a 92 offensive rating when both Desmond Bain and Marcus Smart are off the floor. But at the end of the day, like this team was always going to struggle to score in the half court. That's kind of what their identity is. It, it, they, they just don't have enough offensive skill outside of their initiators to consistently be a great half court offense. What they've always done to bolster their offense is kill people on the offensive glass and kill people in transition right? Last year, they were fifth in offensive rebounds per 100 possessions. This year so far, 24th. That's what it's like not having Steven Adams in your lock or in your lineup anymore, right? Um, and then in transition, they were 15, they were uh, second in the league last year in transition points per possession, uh, excuse me, in transition points scored per game and uh, at 1.14 points per possession. So a really efficient number and the second most frequent transition team. This year, they're 15th in transition points per game and scoring at a rate of just 1.08 points per possession. So usually their offense is bolstered by all of this transition offense in all of these offensive rebound opportunities to make up for their other limitations in the half court offensively. Because even when John Morant was out there last year, they were a bad half court offense. That's not what I'm expecting from this team. I don't think they're going to fix that, right? But they are not getting the easy stuff. Now, the offensive glass... Without Steven Adams, that's hard to replicate. However, you can be a good transition team like you were last year. There's a very specific reason why they haven't been as good this year, and it comes down to the defensive end. Again, like this is a team different from the Dallas Mavericks, who like you're just trying to strive for for mediocre on defense because that gives you a chance with your elite offense. This team has to go the route of the 2020 Lakers and the 2021 Bucks, which is like we are an outstanding, ferocious defensive team that forces a lot of turnovers and gets out in transition after defensive rebounds, right? That's what you're expecting 
from this Memphis Grizzlies team, right? Then, in half-court situations, you're hoping for Ja Morant and Desmond Bain to just make enough plays to push you over the top. Like LeBron and AD did in 2020, like Giannis and, and Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday did in 2021, right? Like, that formula works as long as you are an absolute top-tier defense. 2020, Anthony Davis, one of the best defensive playoff runs I've ever seen. Giannis, 2021, one of the best defensive playoff runs that you'll ever see, right? That's what you have to have. You have to have that top-tier defense. And this team has been mediocre on defense. Mediocre in a sense that it's actually kind of flown under the radar, right? Like, all the talk has been around Memphis's offense. But they're 15th in defensive rating. And this is a team that has always defended well when Jaws out of the lineup because they usually are removing a negative defender and putting a positive defender on the floor, right? According to Cleaning the Glass, they are 23rd in half court defense. And I found this really interesting. So I spent a bunch of time watching the film this morning. Uh, Grizzlies fans, go to my Twitter feed at underscore Jason LT. I clipped like 15 clips to demonstrate this concept that I'm about to go over. But to me, the number one issue I'm noticing on, on tape is way, way, way too much unnecessary overhelping, specifically at the nail, off the ball, and then on the back line when they're overreacting with that low man help, uh, that bringing that third defender over on ball screens when they really don't need to. And, uh, and so I want to I want to give some specific examples. So first of all, nail help. You saw a bunch of examples of this at the Dallas Mavericks game, right? So just imagine Luka Doncic or whoever it is that has the ball on the right wing, right? And then you got like Grant Williams or Derek, or excuse me, uh, Derek Jones Jr. on the left wing, right? Way too many possessions. Primary culprits I noticed on tape were Desmond Bain and Jake LaRavia, but I don't really think it's their fault. I think this is a schematic thing, right? So it comes down to Taylor Jenkins. Those guys are sitting at the nail in help, allowing really easy swing passes to the perimeter for guys to either knock down threes or just quick rip through, right? Now, again... I, the way I would do that is I'd stay a couple of steps closer to your shooter and then you react to drives, right? A lot of these t- times we're seeing the ball handler not even looking to be aggressive, standing in a triple threat, fully contained on the ball while the nail help is there. And the swing pass is taking place, and then they're driving it, or they're either knocking down the wide open three or they're driving it, and now your defense is in rotation. Which is the whole point of why you would offer nail help to begin with, to keep your defense from getting into rotation by containing the ball better, right? Whereas if you stay a little bit closer to home, and now let's say Luca rips through to the right, you lunge in to offer that nail help, right? When you see your man in a compromised position. This is a team that has gifted perimeter defenders. They have Marcus Smart, they have Desmond Bain, right? Like they can contain on the perimeter. They just have to trust their ability to contain on the perimeter. There was a specific play with Jake LaRavia where he wasn't even at the nail. He was all the way on the opposite elbow, like right behind the on-ball defender. Basically a soft double team that just gets swung across the four for an easy closeout opportunity, right? Again, like there's several examples of this that I saw on tape. And you're seeing it in the numbers, by the way. The The Memphis Grizzlies are allowing the second most made threes per 100 possessions. On the second highest percentage, they're allowing 22 wide open threes per game, which means the defender is at least six feet away. That's the fourth most in the entire NBA. Now, the trade-off is they're doing a good job protecting the paint, right? Like they're, they're keeping teams out of the paint. They're allowing just 41 points in the paint per 100 possessions. That's the second best mark in the league. But it's not working for them because they're giving up all these wide open shots on the backside. And again, this is a team that is capable of defending well enough at the point of attack and they're athletic enough on the back line in rotation to not have to do this. It's not just the nail help. I've seen a lot of, uh, of over, uh, over-aggressive over backside help as well. So now think of it like this. There's a two-man action taking place on the right side of the floor. You've got your low man who's guarding the guy in the opposite corner. He's basically leaving that guy to defend that action three on two. And then whoever it is that's, el- that's guarding the man on the right wing is now having to guard two guys on the, on the opposite end of the floor. And usually that, that player's dropping to the baseline and that opposite wing is wide open. There was a play, it wasn't even a ball screen. Seth Curry has the ball on the right wing against John Conchar. I have this play on my Twitter feed, you guys can find it. He rips through to the baseline, kind of gets a step on Conchar, but Conchar recovers and Seth Curry takes a, a retreat dribble. 
So Seth Curry has taken a retreat dribble and is contained by John Conchar. So worst thing that can happen there is Seth Curry uh, takes a contested baseline pull-up jump shot, right? No, because David Roddy, who's guarding the man, the weak side corner guy, just runs underneath the basket offering help. So Seth takes one more advanced dribble and throws a kickout pass to the opposite wing for a wide open three. And like, again, ask yourself, what would you rather give up? A contested pull-up jump shot from Seth Curry or a wide open three on the backside? This is a consistent issue. There, there was another play in the, uh, 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 in the bench group where Jaron Jackson was helping at the basket. This is the third issue. Jaron Jackson, as good of a shot blocker as he is, he's too aggressive in that regard. And he often offers shot blocking help when it's not needed and it throws everything out of whack on the backside in terms of their rebounding, right? There was a play where Dante Exum is driving down the right lane. And I believe Jake LaRavi is guarding him. Doing his job. Slides his feet taking contact in the chest, forces Dante Exum into this wild like hook shot over the top that has no chance of going in. And spoiler alert, he missed it off the side of the rim. But Jaron Jackson, for no apparent reason at all, even though he had no chance to block the shot, just jumps out of his shoes to go try to block it. And so his man taps the offensive rebound out. It goes right to, I think, Seth Curry on the left wing who knocks down a three. And so like again, like they're... They're doing damage to themselves defensively. They're making it more difficult than it needs to be. This is, again, not a Dallas Mavericks team that needs to require on defensive aggression to make up for the fact that they're not capable of being a great defensive team. This team is capable of being a great defensive team. They can defend ball screens two-on-two. They can contain at the point of attack and force guys to take contested shots over the top without constantly existing in rotation and giving up all of these wide-open threes. And again... What do we talk about on the offensive end of the floor? This is a team that needs to generate easy opportunities in transition. The only way to do that is to get stops in defensive rebounds and run or force turnovers and run. What's the best way to force turnovers in the NBA? Guard actions two-on-two and one-on-one. Why? Because then you're home off the ball. You're playing in the passing lane rather than on the ball. And so, let's say that uh, Dante Exum drives and misses that right-handed hook. And so the next time he drives, um, you know, Jaron Jackson doesn't help. Everyone stays home. LaRavia's chesting him up. And now Dante Exum realizes he's in trouble, and he looks around and he just throws a pass to one of the shooters. Except for now you've got someone in the passing lane who catches the ball, and now they're running the other way for a dunk in transition. So, like, not only would this be the weapon to improve their defense, it would also be the thing that would unlock their transition attack and get them back to where they were. Last year, the Memphis Grizzlies were second in transition frequency. This year, they're 15th. It's a problem. And so, again, like, uh, it's easy to just say, oh, we're 0-4, we need John Morant. And don't get me wrong, John Morant, you need him to ever have some sort of championship ceiling, right? Right? But this team is just also schematically setting themselves up to fail with what they're doing on the defensive end of the floor. And again, you can tell when these pos- if you go look at these clips on my Twitter feed, in most of these possessions, the on-ball defender is doing good work. Force those guys to either take tough shots or turn the ball over by passing into, uh, to your defenders who are staying home, run in transition. That will help your half-court offense just enough to give you a chance to win games. This is a team that should be a top-five defense and then hope to be in that 15 to 20 range on the offensive end of the floor. That is their pathway to victory as of right now. Then when John Morant comes back, that's when you can go over the top with what you can be capable of on the offensive end of the floor. And again, like I like it in the big picture because Marcus Smart is a much better offensive player than Dylan Brooks. And you can imagine a scenario where the Grizzlies half-court offense could operate at a much higher level with three high-level offensive players on the floor as opposed to just two in the bigger picture. All right, guys, let's move on to the mailbag. First question, is Wiggins' starting role threatened by Jonathan Kaminga? And secondly, if Moody continues to play well, does that impact Clay's contract negotiations? I do not think Wiggins' starting role is threatened by Jonathan Kaminga. He's just uh, too reliable of a veteran presence for uh, for a Steve Kerr in a um, in a playoff context. I think with Jonathan Kaminga, the idea of bringing him off the bench and then sometimes closing with him is the perfect kind of like 
motivator for Jonathan Kaminga to rein in his decision making because he needs to demonstrate quality decision making to be in the playoff rotation, right? So I think what you're doing right now is the perfect strategy. Start Wiggins, close which guy's playing better. Keep it simple, right? Um, if Moody keeps playing well, it absolutely impacts Clay's contract negotiations. Clay Thompson did not have a good playoff run last year after a great playoff run in the championship year, right? And so if you have a second year in a row where Clay doesn't play well in the playoffs and Moody looks viable, then there's no reason for you for you to uh, murder your cap sheet by overpaying for Clay Thompson, especially when you can probably find a decent deal elsewhere just because of his value as a shooter. Second question, Alfred. Hi, Jason. I play in a men's league, and I'm trying to get my teammates to focus on some of the nitty-gritty winning-type plays, like making sure we are boxing out, playing solid defense, and at the base instead of going for the block every time, and fouling, sprinting back in transition, etc. I feel like I've been quite vocal about this every game, but nothing seems to change. My teammates continue to run and dive into defenses on offense, turn the ball over, pout, don't run back. I can tell they're starting to be annoyed at me for (laughs) winning. for winging it and I feel that they are not listening because I only scored two points a game how would you best handle this situation so Alfred uh, I love this question by the way uh find people who love the game as much as you do and play in a league with them um there's here's the thing like some people are crazy like me and approach men's league games with the same level of intensity I approached every game I was playing when I was in college right And then there are a lot, the majority of people are like, they like basketball. They like to play because it helps them stay in shape. They have some camaraderie with their guys. And so they go up on Sundays or whatever day it is that your men's league is, and they have a good time. If you are wired like me, don't play on a team like that, right? Like I have built, I, I coordinate my team. I pick the roster and I make sure I have guys that give a shit. And so when I go on Sundays, it's kind of like a fun thing for me because it kind of replicates as close as I can at age 32. Now that I'm old and washed, it's as close as I can can come to replicating what my, you know, competitive experience was like when I was younger, because I'm playing with guys that also care and I'm playing in a league where I'm challenged. Right. And so like, again, like if you continue to partner with people that don't take it as seriously as you do, you either need to adjust your expectations or play with someone else because otherwise you're just going to go crazy because they're they're not doing anything wrong. They're being normal. We're the crazy ones. We are the ones who care too much. So you got to find other crazy people to play with is basically what I'm saying. Last mailback question, Antonio. You always talk about the athletic guards versus skill guard player archetypes. Can a skill guard, say for example, Austin Reeves or D'Angelo Russell, become athletic? Is it just hitting the gym or a height thing? Awesome job covering the season so far. Uh, good question, Antonio. Um, I think there's a lot of things you can do to improve your situation when you have physical limitations at the guard position. For one, become a great positional defender that can do a little bit more switching. That's where you hit the weight room. The weight room goes a long way Everywhere on the basketball court, it's like the number one thing that gets overlooked in training. Hit the freaking weight room. It will help you, right? But if you're less athletic, you're going to be more of a positional defender than a ball pressure defender, right? Because if you press up on a better athlete, he's just going to go around you, right? So you've got to take give ground and meet them at spots and be able to absorb contact. So it's about anticipation and your ability to hold your ground. So the weight room is the best you can do. That said, physical battles take place all over the basketball court, and there are certain battles that you're just going to lose. There was a, and when I was watching that Grizzlies Mavericks game today, there was a play where Derek Jones Jr. drove into Derek Rose and had an easy layup. And it's like, I don't care how much Derek Rose hits the weight room. I don't care how uh, much he's in shape. Derek Jones Jr. just is too athletic for him going downhill and he's going to be able to make a shot, right? And so again, there's a limitation, but you do the best you can in the weight room and through technique and anticipation to be a good positional defender when you have physical limitations. All right, guys, that is all I have for this part of today's uh, Hoops Tonight programming. We're going to be back later tonight breaking down the ESPN slate. As always, I appreciate you guys and I will see you then.